Welcome to Older Militaries Radio TV and Rely Phone Catholics and what we do is all for free and for our love of Jesus Christ and for our Holy Mother, the Church, and we'll defend our Holy Mother, the Church. Today begins our next venture at OMC Radio TV to defend the Holy Mother Church and expose the evil inside it. We begin part three on Emanuela Orlandi, and we'll be getting we'll be dropping facts that will shock you. Welcome, Brother Alexis. Thank you, AJ, for having me on Auto Militaris Radio TV as editor and publisher of FromRome.info and a journal on uh, news and commentary about the Vatican, Rome, Italy, and the Catholic Church, published from Rome, uh, where, from where I'm speaking to you right now. I appreciate the apostle you do at Order Militaris Radio TV because you're always uh, shedding the light of truth on, on, on all, especially on corruption in the church, which is a topic of which we Catholics know nothing because our clergy tell us nothing, and yet we must know it if we're ever going to clean up the church uh, and all the corruption in it, which is as the years goes on, becomes more and more evident and more and more documented. So. This is our third program on Emmanuel Orlandi. And for those who don't know, Emmanuel Orlandi in 1983 was a 16 year old girl, the daughter of a an, an Vatican employee who worked for John Paul II. And um, one day she went to a music class and she disappeared and she was never seen again. Her body was never found and no witnesses ever came forward who were credible that said they saw her after the fact. So there's new news in the case from Rome, Italy. And uh, can you summarize that, AJ? Uh, it is now pointing fingers at her uncle. Let me get his name here. Uh, Mario Meneguzzi. Meneguzzi. Yep. So, the files include a letter in which a priest told the Vatican Secretary of State that Orlandi's older sister, Nat Natalina, had revealed during confession that her uncle, Mario Meneguzzi, had sexually abused her, according to Italian television channel Last Seven. But Orlandi's brother, Petro, who has for years campaigned for the truth and believes the Vatican knows what happened to Manu Manuela reacted angrily. And uh, he's still saying it can't put blame on my family for the taking part in this. OK, so first of all, I would just want to comment the anything heard in the confessional, a priest cannot report to anyone unless the person gives permission. And it was reported in the Italian press that the sister of Emmanuel Landi, who is still alive, uh, the sister is, that is, she said, no, that wasn't a case of sexual abuse. It was that the uncle attempted to uh, amorously embrace her or something to that effect. So that's not really, a, a, I guess, according to interpretation, that would be in modern things, a sexual microaggression, or it could be an unwanted advance or things like that. But it certainly wasn't great. Now, uh, Mr. Meneguzzi has no one to defend him. He's dead. Mm -hmm. And um, most of the people involved in this case are dead. The brother is outraged. He's just like, this is the ultimate insult. This is what he's quoted is in the article at the La Repubblica. The article of the Republica, though, details some very disturbing facts. The first of which is that Meneguzzi noticed after the disappearance of his niece, that someone was following him. And he recorded the license plate number and then he turned to who, AJ? And, and he was told who this car was. He was, uh, I believe, to the Italian police. And mm -hmm. they revealed it is the, it was a car of the Italian secret service whatever yeah so somehow Meneguzzi knew someone in italian secret services and not just any secret service but Siste. 
Now, SISTE is a particular high level secret services. It is established in Italian law to defend the institutions of the Republic from any attempt to overthrow them or corrupt them. And it deals with today, it deals with three things, national and international terrorism and the mafia. Uh, it probably, I don't think there was a concept of international terrorism in 83, but maybe, maybe there was, so. AJ, does this sound like an agency that should be investigating the disappearance of a 16-year-old girl? No. Okay. So, um, the second disturbing fact in the Republica article is that the police thought Menaguzzi was the person who did it. Mm -hmm. because he fit the description perfectly of the last person seen with Emmanuel Ella Randi. Now, it is not unusual for the uncle to pick up his niece after she takes a music lesson. That's not in Italy. That wouldn't be unusual at all. Except Meneguzzi always claimed to be in a town, another part of Italy at, on that day. And that turned out not to be true, or at least that is claimed today not to be true. Um, But the investigation in this case was manipulated. It was manipulated when a person of a very high figure at Rome spoke about the case right as it began to be investigated, saying that it was a case of international terrorism. Mm -hmm. and AJ, how damaging could a public statement from a very influential person like that be to a criminal investigation? Very, um, got police actually doing a job, getting close to the facts and to the truth and possible whereabouts of the person that is missing. And all of a sudden, someone like that would say something to stop it and point it in a different direction. Um, what's, what's that usually a sign of? <laughs> they're involved at least, or the, the actual person. So um, the Italian police should then change their investigation and stop their line of investigation on Menaguzzi, which is something they should not have done and could not have done unless there was a lot of political pressure put on them to start investigating the line of international terrorism. Uh, it turns out there was no evidence of international terrorism. Now, who was this person who corrupted the investigation from the beginning, AJ, according to the Italian press, Republica? John Paul II. So this is very serious, and this is why we're going to talk in this program about a line of investigation that hasn't really been looked into and needs to be looked into because of this intervention. It's the first forensic fact. There's another forensic fact that we need to look at is what was the last thing the father of Emanuela Orlandi said about this case before he died? Who did he say was responsible? What was his exact words? My superiors, my superior at the Vatican betrayed me. And he and his superior was not some low-level guy at the Vatican. He worked under John Paul II. Yeah, he frequently met with him in person. So now let's look at this phrase now, because I'm, I, I put a lot of importance on what words mean. And when you're analyzing the last testimony of someone, listen to it very carefully. Now, this crime of her disappearance, did it take place in Italian territory or Vatican territory? Uh, Italian. So it falls under the jurisdiction of the Italian police. Mm -hmm. So John Paul II has no obligation to investigate this crime. Mm -hmm. But when you say someone's betrayed you, that means they broke your trust. Mm -hmm. Now, it couldn't be because he didn't investigate it. So what trust was broken? Now, I'm an anthropologist. When I think of a father saying you betrayed me, 
what comes to mind? I brought my daughter to your house and you did something to her, even though you're an older man. You betrayed me. Doesn't that make sense? That's the only possible thing that a father would say of his employer in regard to his daughter. So this is the second forensic point, and this points in this exact same direction of the first forensic evidence. It points to John Paul II. The third thing is, has the Vatican ever cooperated in this investigation until recently? No. Now, how could that be unless someone at the highest levels decided not to cooperate? Now, it'd have to be someone who was close to John Paul II and close to Pope Benedict. Because the wouldn't investigate this. Someone who's not close to Bergoglio because he opened up the investigation. That means it must be either Cardinal Ratzinger or John Paul II. Mm -hmm. The third fact pointing to John Paul II. Okay, so John Paul II. What kind of a man was he on sexual morals? It, could it be possible that he had any sexual liaison with this young girl? Let's look at other evidence that's known about him about which no one disputes. Was he in the habit of dressing scantily in the presence of young women on holidays? Yes, in Poland. Mm, and there's pictures of it. Was he, were there photos of him in the nude at private pools? Yeah, at the uh, mobster, puppet master of the P2 Lodge, Lesio Gelli, as the photographs. It is, if, if you look into the biographies of John Paul II, when he visited the United States in 76 and popped into the uh, seminary at Philadelphia to visit the seminarians, he came in dressed in shorts and a t-shirt and he ordered pizza and they didn't even know who this guy was. He says, I'm the Bishop of Krakow. I myself met a whole group of seminarians in 1994 at a dinner in Connecticut. They were visiting from Poland and I sat with them because in those days I just idolized John Paul II. I said, um, they go, why do you want to sit with us? I said, because we have a, one of the greatest popes in modern time, Pope John Paul II. And I, I just feel like I love all these Poles because you have such, such a great man. Silence. Dead silence. Now, if you say that to seminarians about a bishop of their country that's become the Pope, they're all going to say, yeah, he's the greatest Pope on earth. Mm -hmm. They didn't say that. They were silent. And they were silent a long time. I said, look, I, I'm objective. I'm all into facts. But I have a degree in anthropology and I see they're all silent which means that what I said about him isn't true. He's a very different person. Please tell me the truth about this man. And one of the courageous seminarians, after much prodding and under a low voice leaning towards me, said, he is the most liberal of all the bishops of Poland. He has a reputation for immorality. And we are disgusted that this man was raised to this apostolic see because he's a disgrace and he's going to destroy the church. I was dumbfounded. I was like, and these were not seminarians of the Society of St. Pius X. These were diocesan seminarians. Okay. John Paul II, did he promote men who were known sexual predators to the episcopacy and cardinalate? Yes. Did he do a few of them or did he like do all of them? He did all of them. Did he protect one of the worst sexual predators in history, the founder of the Legionnaires of Christ? Yeah. Who uh, raped his own seminarians, uh, had illicit marriages, and raped his own natural children. Mm -hmm. John Paul II wouldn't even touch them. And when that man died, everyone went to his funeral, except Cardinal Ratzinger. Cardinal Ratzinger knew how corrupt he was because Cardinal Ratzinger had looked over the accusations. And Cardinal Ratzinger, as Pope Benedict XVI, has a perfect record of purity. There's not a single person in history that said 
he he had an affair or he touched a person, male or female. The man was obviously pure. Did John Paul II write a book with sexually explicit words and images in it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's love and responsibility. He wrote that before he, he became Pope. So the preponderance of evidence is that John Paul II was a lascivious man. That's the preponderance of evidence. So a working hypothesis, and don't be shocked what I'm about to say is, he got too familiar with Emanuela and Emanuela got pregnant. And Emanuela wanted to keep the child because she was a good Catholic. What would the revelation of that do to the whole CIA plan that put John Paul II into the papacy and was using his papacy for their affairs around the world? What would that have done to it, the revelation of that? It would have, it, it would have stopped in their tracks all their plans of drug running, weapons running, running money to uh, Poland for solidarity, all that. The scandal in modern times would have been so great, I dare say that there would be an insistence by most of the hierarchy that he resign from the papacy, mm -hmm. that he gave. There would be an insistence of it because mothers, families, children advocates, pro-lifers, no one would give a penny to the Vatican again, not with a filthy man like that. Now, that would, in my hypothesis, create unimaginable pressure for the Vatican to silence this case. The Vatican's already working with the CIA, who's already paying off the Italian secret services. According to the press, however, who kidnapped Emanuela Orlandi, and why does this narrative not make sense, AJ? According to the press, um, it was the mobster Enrico de Pettis, the leader of the Bandita. And was he ever convicted for this? No. And uh, why would he kidnap this girl? I mean, you could kidnap any girl in, in Italy. Why kidnap this girl? What value did it have? It is stated that he wanted to to throw the blame on the head of the IOR, which would have been Marquinkus, because of all the failed dealings that were going on currently at the IOR in the 80s. OK, so the scandal about the IRR had already broken and Vatican was in negotiations to pay for the failure of Banca Ambrosiana. Calvi had already been. And um, <clears throat> Marchinkus, we did a report on Marchinkus. Who is Marchinkus? AJ, briefly, how corrupt is this guy? Archbishop Paul Marchinkus from Sistrel, Illinois, hometown of one Al Capone. Yeah, and as a young man, he where, where did he have the habit of visiting? Uh, brothels and everything at Al Capone Rain. And he learned from the mobsters under Al Capone how to be yeah. like, and, like them. And yet he becomes a and yet he becomes a priest. Now a man who visits brothels and becomes a priest, I can tell you, he does not have a vocation. Someone is paying him to infiltrate the church. And he goes on to become the right hand man of Paul the Six. He was a big guy. Someone attempted to assault Paul VI, and Machinkos was there to defend the Pope. And after that, he got promoted. Mm -hmm. And he was without any any financial degree or expertise. He was put in charge of the Vatican Bank, which becomes the money laundering machine of, of John Paul II. Did John Paul II come into the papacy because of the intercession of Marchinkos? What do you think, AJ? Um, uh, he had a role in it, but um, I think it's another, also a cardinal from Chicago that was being thought about being replaced by Marchinkus. Yeah, so Marchinkus was 
He is in Chicago. Why would you choose such a man? Everyone knows in the United States, Chicago run by the mom. Mm -hmm. In Chicago, all run by the mom. Yeah. If they wanted Marchinkus, um, the American bishops, I think, were against. Uh, hold on, folks. Uh, we get, yeah. <laughs> so, um, they cut me off. Yeah, a little bit. You're freezing me. Where, okay. Uh, so where, much. Yeah, go ahead. We're getting a little too touchy touchy here with the truth here, and they're starting to cut off Brother Alexis. So, uh, stay tuned until he unfreezes and everything. So, go on if you can. Can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you now. Okay. Can you see me move? No. No. There we go. <laughs> OK, so so I got too close to the truth. So the, the, the matter is, is that Marchinkus was the right hand man of Paul VI at the death of Paul VI. John Paul I is elected. One of the first thing he says before he's bumped off is that he wants to remove Marchinkus from Vatican Bank. On the 33rd day after his election, that's a Masonic number, uh, he is found dead in his bed with vomit all over the place. Yallop, David A. Yallop, an investigative reporter of, of, of fine reputation in the United Kingdom, he wrote a book about the death of John Paul I. Uh, first. And who did he say put the poison of digitalis in John Paul I's medicine bottle? Marquinkus. So Marquinkus gets rid of John Paul the first and the next person elected as a poll is that a coincidence uh no because everyone's thinking it's going to be Cardinal Winsinski because he's well known popular anti-communist fighter but uh it was an unknown no one knew about this guy not even the press and mm -hmm. so the CIA used their man inside the conclave. We'll talk about this more, maybe Friday, hopefully. Mm -hmm. John Cardinal Cody. Mm -hmm. To suggest the name of Carol Wotiwa. Now, <clears throat> we did a program about John Paul II being recruited to the CIA, the evidence for its speculation. Uh, but if you start connecting the dots, you have to ask a further question. Did John Paul II know that his predecessor was murdered by his allies? Mm -hmm. And I think there's strong evidence to say he knew it was, because why? You're in the conclave. They're talking about electing the Pope. The previous one just got poisoned to death in his bed by someone in the Vatican, maybe someone in the conclave. AJ, if you were a cardinal and someone said to you, would you like to be a candidate? What would you say? No, I'm good. <laughs> who would be the only person who wouldn't be afraid? The man that, that they support. The man who the murderers support and the man who knows who the murderers are, his mm -hmm. friends. And a matter of fact, once he's elected, he never investigates the Vatican Bank. He is this famous quote by John Paul II. I have never crossed a threshold of the IRR during my pontificate. Marchinkus does retire from president of the Vatican Bank and is protected for the rest of his life by the Vatican at the highest levels and by the CIA at the highest level from all prosecution. He's granted immunity. He was allowed to keep his secretary of state passport until he died. That made him immune from prosecution. Yeah. Which is outrageous. Yeah. Yes. In the, in the research on David Yellow, he got Gilly arrested. He got all these guys put in prison, but he's like, all of them, they, thanks to my investigative work, only one I could, could not bring to justice, and that was Marquinkus. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> 
The story in the 80s was that Marcinkus removed because John Paul II finally realized that he wasn't really on the up and up and they needed an honest man to run the Vatican Bank. But that was a fake story because the man who John Paul II appointed to head the Vatican Bank was in 2020 prosecuted by the Italian government for stealing 65 million euro from the Vatican Bank. He was a, he, a thing that Marcinkus never did. Marcinkus didn't rob a penny as far as we know from the Vatican Bank. So John Paul II didn't replace Marcinkus with a more honest man. He replaced him with a more corrupt man. So mm -hmm. why did he replace him? So <clears throat> Marcinkus goes to brothels. And as far as we know from many reports, we, it was, we, we, we related this in our show in Archbishop Machinkus, he went to brothels his whole life as an archbishop, as a priest, and as a bishop. Now, was someone else in the Vatican known to go out at night at the Vatican all on his own without telling anyone? Yeah. Who was that? John Paul II. And this is not rumor from a mafia. This is confirmed by his personal secretary, who's now the Archbishop of Krakow and a cardinal. I think a cardinal, maybe he's just an archbishop uh, and several Polish monsignors. Now, this is against the law. It's a violation of the Lateran Pact, because in the treaty between the Italian Republic uh, and the Vatican City State, the Pope is considered a second head of state in the Italian Republic, and that when he enters the Italian territory, the Minister of the Interior must be notified, and he will be given the escort due to the President of the Republic of Italy. Police, cars, helicopter, train, however he's traveling, as long as he's in Italian territory. Even when the Pope goes to Germany, it's an Italian plane, military plane or helicopter that takes him there. Benedict, for example, when Benedict went to visit his brother dying in Bavaria, I think it was an Italian military hop helicopter that flew him the whole way, mm -hmm. or plane at least. <clears throat> so this is a violation of the Lateran Pact. What, AJ, imagine you're the Pope, there's a Lateran Pact, you want to go on a stroll in Rome, do you have to go out secretly? No. What's wrong with going with police escort? Nothing. You go to meet people and so they could recognize you, don't you? Mm -hmm. You're a pastor of souls, right? Mm -hmm. you, you preach that the priests should wear their habit in public. So there's only one reason to go out of the Vatican a hundred times in secret and sometimes even by yourself. And that is because you're doing something untoward. Maybe you're doing it with Marcinkus. Marcinkus knew all the brothels mm -hmm. in Rome. And there are Vatican properties that have gay brothels in them. That's a published fact in Rome. Uh, and I have stayed in bed and breakfasts around the Vatican when I came to Rome in 2019, started my reporting. And they're full of people that take there are lovers there and have sex in the rooms. You can't even sleep at night. It's like a brothel. It's just absolutely triple X rated. The sounds that are coming out. And I, I can tell you, you don't know if it's a man or two men or a man or a woman from the sounds. I'm not an expert, so I couldn't tell. So it is, in my opinion, a line of investigation that must be opened and must be asked because why was her body never found if she wasn't pregnant? Mm -hmm. Because if she was pregnant and her body was found, they could find out who the father was. Yeah. And who's the only person in the Vatican who would have, could have kept that from being investigated for all these years? John Paul II. So this ties in everything we know about John Paul II, that he promoted vicious, serial, pedophiles, uh, rapists, uh, Freemasons, uh, government agents to the highest offices of the church. He appointed them. No one made him. He worked with the CIA who 
paid him in money made in the drug trade, making young people drug addicts and destroying their lives and sending them to hell. He took that money mm -hmm. and he sent it off to solidarity to liberate his country. Liberate, it's a Catholic doctrine. If it required one venial sin to save the world, it would not be licit to do it. Not even one venial sin. We're talking about hundreds of millions of mortal sins over two decades of his pontificate. And maybe at the youth days, we just did a report in the youth days. Yeah, so. You, if you think this show was shocking, wait till Friday. Hey, Jay, I, I thank you for having me on Auto Militaris Radio TV. We are devout Catholics. We're not saying these things about John Paul II because he is or uh, was or was or is or would be or, in our opinion, a good or bad man. That is the Roman pontiff. We're saying it merely because we're letting where they may. We're letting the facts speak for themselves. Uh, even a pope has no right to be immune from prosecution in a crime of this kind. Mm -hmm. And as we showed you, all the facts are consistent with the possibility that I laid out, that he got too familiar with Emmanuel Olandi, got her pregnant. She was not gonna have an abortion because that's Catholic teaching. And he asked his friends in the mafia to solve the problem. The final fact is the most damning of all, that when the father insisted to know what happened to his daughter, John Paul II said to him, don't worry about your daughter, she's in heaven now. Mm -hmm. And how could he say that? Unless he knew she was dead. Mm -hmm. But how did he know she was dead? Because the body was never found. Yep. Yeah. So please like and share this program. And if you're not on social media, share these programs. Use your email list and or telegram list and what, however you share um, uh, podcasts, video programs. And um, as you saw, we were again a little scrambled there. Again, uh, so please support the our studio fundraisers so we can have our own recording equipment, our own servers, our own everything. So this won't happen. This is Order Militaris Radio TV signing off. Deus Volt. Deus Volt.